The Rings of Power Season 2, Episode 8 is an unapologetic anti-Tolkien abomination. <laughs> At the same time, it is one of the funniest things I have seen in a very long time. And I watch Clue this week. At this point, it is a full-on parody of Tolkien. <laughs> Let's get into it, shall we? I can attack so I cast. A little foreshadowing. The writers tried to name drop, cram as many Jackson adaptation references as physically possible into one episode. They're so ham-fisted about it that at one point I expected the actor to turn to the camera, wink, and then grin with the bing of the light bouncing off their teeth. The last time we saw our good buddy Prince Durin, he was busy breaking his oaths to Doogie Elrond and in so doing, betraying all the elves. Why would he do such a thing, you ask? It's because Disa said, Stop! You can't go help the elves! Something bad is happening in Moria! You need to come back now! I said now, 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 now! What has Disa's tail feathers all in a knot? What's the reason she wants Prince Durin to stab the elves in the back? Are the orcs invading Khazadum? Is there a natural disaster? A fire? A flood? Has there been a revolution rioting in the streets? Nah, nothing like that. It's just Prince Durin's daddy beat up a few people so he could go do a little mining all by his lonesome. Deesa is screaming, it's the ring, it's evil, it's taking control of your daddy. You have to stop him from mining before something bad happens. Like, I don't know, maybe a Balrog will wake up. I already woke up the Balrog, so that's my fault. But anyhow, stop him from mining before something bad happens. Even when the writers want you to think this is Prince Durin's hero moment. He's going to finally stand up to the evil that's taken over his daddy. They still have to show he's subservient to Disa. Yes, dear. I'll do what you want. I love you. <laughs> Prince Duran says, this is bad. Now, after I leave. Now, this is important. Look at me. Look at me. Are you listening? Pay attention. After I leave, I do not want anybody to follow me. Everybody got that? Okay, I'm out of here. This entire show, seasons one and two, Disa has shown nothing but contempt for Prince Durin. So why is that going to change now? Sure enough, at the bottom of the tunnel, Prince Durin finds his daddy busily mining all by his lonesome. Prince Durin raises his axe and he shouts, Stop mining and take off the ring or I'll take the ring with the hand still attached. The king just sneers, are you strong enough to do it? This is where we get our first evil message of the episode. Prince Durin lowers his axe and starts sobbing. No, you're stronger than me. You've always been stronger than me. I can't defeat you. <laughs> Morality, justice, standing up for what you believe in, Trying to save your people from certain doom? All of that is meaningless. The only thing that matters? Power. Might makes right. In fact, don't even try to resist those in power. Oh yeah, that's a very Tolkienian message. Why wasn't Disa the one who went down to confront the king? Well, we'll learn here a little bit. There was a reason. But as far as the interactions with the king... Disa, Prince Durin, it would have all been the same regardless. To be fair to the Rings of Power, before Season 2 even started, they warned us they were going to feminize all the men. We see a reenactment, almost beat for beat, where Elendil's daughter comes to him after he's been thrown in prison and begs him, please join our side, the baddies, and we will spare your life. Prince Durin begs, pleads, weeps. Dad, I love you. I've always admired you. You're my hero. Don't do this, please, for me. And the emasculation of Prince Durin is now complete. King Durin's reaction? Pfft, piss off. 
keeps mining, blows a hole through a wall. Guess what? The ring was right. They've just found the mother load of mithril. This scene and everything that led up to it makes zero sense. As far as everybody knows, the dwarven rings were made by the greatest elven smith who's ever lived. The elves are beings of light, of good. And every time the dwarven ring has been used, it has benefited the dwarves. No one should be screaming, the ring is evil, destroy it. I mean, it would make sense that Prince Durin, Princess Disa, would be saying to King Durin, hey, that ring, it's pretty powerful. Why don't you, when you're not actually using it, wear it around your neck, put it in a pouch, or better yet, lock it up, keep it safe. Because wearing it all the time may not be good for you. Definitely, no one should be screaming, don't mine in the mine, because something bad is going to happen. Disa has knowledge she shouldn't have. More importantly, there is no way she could have that knowledge. But we all know why she has that knowledge. Every important story thread must go through a woman. And a woman always has to be right. Now we get to the comedy. Just as the two Durans are drooling all over the Mithril, the Balrog appears. <laughs> Remember all the name dropping and references I mentioned earlier? Well, here we go. Somebody shouts, Rod! And the Balrog grabs King Durin by the ankle with his whip. This particular Balrog isn't the sharpest knife in the drawer. Or maybe he's still groggy from his age-long nap. At any rate... He gets in his own way, trashes the place. In his flailing about, the Balrog manages to send Prince Durin flying. Don't worry, Prince Durin's fine. He signed the contract for season three, after all. The Balrog finally makes it up to where King Durin's standing. And King Durin's going to be like, I'm going to fight the Balrog. Okay, why? But okay. Just before King Durin goes to fight the Balrog, he decides, I'll take off the ring. Again, why? A ring that, again, as far as anybody should be concerned at this point in the story, is a good thing. A ring that makes King Durin stronger, more powerful, more intelligent, and gives him important information at key moments. Just as he gets ready to get into a fight with a being that can kill a wizard, he goes... Nah, I don't need this. Let's go. Prince Durin, who we've established at this point to Ed Nagium that he absolutely loves his father. He wouldn't stand up to his father unless Disa made him. He wouldn't have rebelled against his father unless Disa made him. He wouldn't have come down into the mines to confront his father unless Disa made him. And once he confronted his father, he wouldn't fight his father because he loves him so much. Prince Durin, seeing his father preparing to fight the Balrog, makes the very first moral decision he's made this entire show. He's going to join his father, and together they will stand side by side to protect their people from this evil. <gasps> Are we going to see self-sacrifice? Ha! <laughs> not a chance. Disa's not going to allow anybody to make a moral decision around her. No, ma'am. This meaty arm comes out of nowhere, grabs Prince Durin, and then the two of them just stand there and watch as King Durin leaps at the Balrog. At this point, I'm screaming, throw Disa to the Balrog. Maybe after he's through eating her, He'll be so full, he'll want to take another nap that might last, I don't know, two or three more ages. At the end of the episode, Prince Durin is the new king of Khazadum, and he learns a Region has fallen. The elves are in a dire situation. And he says, don't worry, we will do everything in our power to help the elves in this time of need. At this point, Disa interrupts the king. I repeat, she interrupts the king and says, uh-uh, we ain't helping nobody. We got our own problems to deal with. At this point, I'm shouting, take off her head, chop her up, do whatever it takes to get rid of this evil woman. Every single situation that requires a decision, whichever decision is the most immoral, unethical, illegal, dishonest, underhanded, and devious, 
That's the one for Disa. <laughs> one of the problems Kazadum faces, the other Dwarven kingdoms, they forked over a lot of tribute. Now they want their rings. This entire time, Disa has been screaming, the rings are evil, destroy the rings. Now they have control of the rings. They haven't destroyed them yet. I'm willing to bet you all five bucks, five George Washingtons that in season three, if there is a season three, that Disa harangues, browbeats, nags, forces Prince Doran, oh, my bad, King Doran, into putting on one of those rings. <laughs> this woman is evil. Let's talk about the mysterious stranger that we have no clue who he might be in any way, shape, or form. The mysterious stranger that they keep calling for some odd reason, Grand Elf, over and over again. Ah, it probably doesn't matter. Don't worry about it. He finally meets the Dark Wizard who tries to engage in one of the most half-assed attempts at persuasion I have ever seen. The Dark Wizard says, Hey, buddy, I know you don't remember me, but we're old friends from way back. For old time's sake, let's work together, combine our powers, unite to fight against Sauron, because he's evil, and I'm definitely not evil. The Mysterious Stranger who for some reason people keep calling Grand Elf over and over again. Eh, probably not important. Don't worry about it. He asks the question, well, what about after we defeat Sauron? What then? The Dark Wizard says, well, technically one way to look at it, I do kind of want to take over the world, rule in Sauron's place after he's defeated. But the important thing is we have to defeat Sauron. So come on, buddy. Be a team player. Let's do this. The mysterious stranger, who we have no clue whatsoever who he might be, says, um, no, I'm good. You go do you over there and I'll stay here. The dark wizard says, well, since you won't join me, I'm going to kill everything you love, starting with those hobbits. Can't say that. We don't have the rights to that. I'm going to start by killing all these little... <gasps> Can't say that. Oh, almost got in trouble there. Um, What are we calling them? Starfoot, Harfoot, uh, Harfoots and Stewards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to kill all these Harfoots and Stewards. <laughs> the Dark Wizard casts a spell and then pieces out. Doesn't stick around to find out if he actually kills anybody. <laughs> These people are actually ripping off Austin Powers now. Of course, you knew it was going to happen. The mysterious stranger, who we have absolutely no clue who he might be, saves the not hobbits. But their village is trashed, so they set off to go find the Shire, or the non-copyright violating equivalent. Just as he's leaving the ruined village, the mysterious stranger, who we have absolutely no clue who he might be, despite people calling him Grand Elf over and over and over again, finds his staff. Don't you get it? That's why Gandalf, well, if this was Gandalf, we're not saying that, but that's why Gandalf loves the Hobbit so much. They're the origins of his power. Well, well. Several female hobbits are the origins of his power. When the mysterious stranger returns to Tom Bombadil, old Tom asks him, so what's your name? And the mysterious stranger says, Grand Elf, Grand uh, Gandalf, that's my name. <laughs> so stupid. When we were last in Numenor, Queen Muriel was thrown to the Kraken and thrown back out. By the rules that were established, that means she's the rightful queen. Karl Marx and his cronies say, <laughs> not so fast. We've determined she used witchcraft. She deceived the Kraken, which means I'm still in charge. Stupid, stupid, stupid. This is the last argument Karl Marx and his bunch would make. The only reason why he's in power in the first place is because an eagle landed and stood beside him. Divine intervention. Once you raise the possibility that divine intervention can be manipulated to benefit one side or the other, then it becomes reasonable to ask, how do we know you, Karl Marx, didn't manipulate the eagles for your benefit? 
we end up being back at square one. The only one with a legitimate claim to power is Muriel. What Karl Marx and his cronies do next further undermines any claim that he had to authority. They start arresting the faithful, the very people whose beliefs allowed him to take power in the first place. Stupid. Big boobs and no brains, the only reason why Karl Marx and his cronies are in power in the first place? She comes running to her daddy, Elindiel, and says, they're coming to arrest you. They're going to kill you. You have to run. So let me get this straight. Big Boobs had no problem with their daddy being arrested last time, had no problem with him being thrown to the Kraken. As far as they were concerned, that was a death sentence. But now, all of a sudden, she just can't stand the thought of losing her daddy. <laughs> we all know what's going on here. A woman can never be portrayed in a negative light, ever. Big Boobs isn't bad. She was deceived by bad men. Well, there is another reason they need to save her daddy. They want to do some more name dropping. Elindiel runs straight to Mariel, and he tells her, you need to get out of the city now. Karl Marx and his bunch are going nuts. They're going to do something crazy. But don't worry, I have a way to smuggle you out. You all will notice something that just so happens to be laying around. Mariel says, no, I'm not going to leave. I'm going to do the right thing and stay. Why is that the right thing? But okay. She says, I'm glad you stopped by though, because it just so happens I have a gift, something I've been meaning to give you for a long time. It's a sword. And guess what? It just so happens to have a name. Can you all guess the name of the sword? Narso. <laughs> when she gives the sword, she says, take this sword and with it, claim your destiny. <laughs> Wow, Muriel has read Lord of the Rings too. I didn't realize the Lord of the Rings was a bestseller in Middle Earth as well. Although I'm willing to bet you it was never translated into the dark speech. Back to the fall of Aregion. Talk about symbolism, crucifixion, trying to make Celebrimborn some sort of Christ-like figure. Wow, let me stand back before the lightning strikes. But don't worry, Sauron, the being of pure evil, he cried when he crucified Celebrimborn. That proves he's not evil, right? Poor old Adar. Now that he has one of the elven rings, he's reverted back to his original elven form. Look, look, elves, orcs, they're the same. There's no good and evil. It's all just perspective. Adar takes off the ring and he hands it back to Galadriel. The ring that he just murked a bunch of people for? The ring that he burnt down the city to get? Yeah, that ring. He just hands it back to her as an act of good faith. Why Adar felt the need to show good faith to a prisoner, I don't know, but it is what it is. Adar tells Galadriel, now that I've shown my goodwill, you need to unite with me to defeat Sauron. And if you do, I promise that once Sauron has been defeated, I will take the orcs back to Mordor and we will never wage war ever again. Scout's honor, cross my heart. The orcs are going to beat their spears into plowshares. Hallelujah! Peace in our time. Whoop, whoop, probably don't want to make that reference. Well, peace at any rate. When I heard Adar say that, I'm like, he did. Y'all remember that orc with his loving family who didn't want to go to war? All he wanted to do was spend time playing catch with Uglug? Well, right after he has his first meeting with Sauron, he comes up to Adar and says, Stab, stab, stab. We all know who didn't sign the contract for season three. After Adar did, Sauron starts to try to seduce Galadriel. Come on, let's do evil together. It'll be fun. Rumor has it, you like the bad boys, and I'm as bad as they come. Galadriel's response, well, I never, I could never do such a thing because I'm a lady. Morphid Clark should never be allowed to hold a sword. We get one of the most awkward sword fights in cinema history. Y'all remember how I said the writers are obsessed with name dropping, making references? Well, they're not content with sticking with Tolkien. <laughs> they try to rip off the Princess Bride. Ooh, 
not good. Of course, they have to show that Galadriel is a far superior warrior than one of the most powerful beings in all of Middle-earth. The only reason why Sauron wins? He gets all tricksy, uses his illusions, deceives and confuses Galadriel. Oh, brother, the poor woman is deceived by an evil man again. Don't worry, though. Galadriel is one tough mama. She can take a punctured heart and still keep fighting, still resisting Sauron. Did you all know that Galadriel is the only being in all of Middle-earth that can resist Sauron's mind control? I didn't know that either. In fact, the show showed the opposite up to this very moment, but whatever. Sauron says, give me the ring, give me the ring, and there's evil music playing. You know things are getting serious when you hear the evil music. Why Sauron just didn't go and take the ring from Gladriel's body while she was laying on the ground? Who knows? But at any rate, he's saying, give me the ring. Gladriel stands up, and even though her heart's punctured, she says, no, and jumps off a cliff. High King Gilgadaddy and Doogie Elrond use the elven rings to heal Galadriel. We're back to name dropping and ripping off references. This time around, they're going for two. Well, if you're going to rip off stuff, I guess go all the way. Galadriel is wearing gray when she dies. When she comes back to life, she's wearing white. Galadriel is the real Gandalf of this show. Y'all notice white robes, long flowing hair, natural makeup, the photography, soft focus, the glow that surrounds Galadriel. They're trying to reference Kate Blanchett. I don't think you want to be making that one-to-one -one comparison at this point in the Rings of Power. Poor Morford Clark comes off as a cheap imitation. People keep saying the Rings of Power tarnishes Tolkien's legacy. <laughs> no, it doesn't. The writers of the Rings of Power wishes it did, but no, it doesn't. The first thing you would have to do to convince people that the Rings of Power somehow tarnishes Tolkien's legacy is first convince people that the Rings of Power has anything to do with Tolkien. And that doesn't pass the smell test. As I said earlier, the Rings of Power has reached full-on parody territory a long time ago. No one's buying this shit. I don't know about y'all, but I'm looking forward to season three. This is glorious. At any rate, I hope I've given y'all something to think about and maybe a good laugh along the way. Until next time, y'all be safe. If you all are still here, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. While you're at it, why don't you like this video, subscribe to the channel, click that notification bell. You can hear me yammer on about something else next time. Please like and subscribe. Please leave a comment.